It seems to me, Georgi, that uh, clearly an American standard is driving the world and its economy today. The thing is that uh, world GDP forecasts have been revised up after the U.S. fiscal stimulus package. The USD 1.9 trillion price tag represents more than two two and a half percent of global GDP. As a result, Fitch ratings now expect global GDP to expand by 6.1 percent this year, revised up from 5.3 percent in their December 2020 global economic outlook. GDP outturns were stronger than expected in fourth quarter of 2020, particularly in Europe and emerging markets, and world GDP declined by 3.4 percent in 2020 as a whole compared to uh, Fitch's uh, previous forecast of a 3.4 0.7% decline. World GDP is now expected to be 2.5% higher in 2021 than in the pre-pandemic year of 2019. Yeah, by the way, Elena, what were some of the focuses uh, of your interview with uh, Fitch Ratings this time? Uh, I know that you have talked to Brian Colton, he is chief economist of the Fitch Ratings and one of the authors of the Global Global economic um, yes, yes, Georgi, you are uh, right. One interesting point in the outlook was that even though unemployment forecasts for the major economies have been cut, job market recovery still continue to lag. Mr. Colton explained that leisure and transport industries are labor intensive and are still um, affected by the social distancing. U.S. employment is still 6.1 percent below pre-pandemic levels compared to GDP, which is 2.4 percent lower, while LNT accounts for more than one third of furloughed workers in the EU. So we try to analyze how to close this gap. And in this context, Fitch uh, believes that it is still reasonable to assume that the health crisis will ease by mid-year, allowing social contact to start to recover, even though vaccine rollout has gained momentum, particularly in the UK and the US. But the Eurozone has had a slower start, but the program should accelerate in second quarter of 2021. But Fitch warns uh, that immunization delays or problems remain the a key downside risk to the forecast. We can now listen to a short part of the interview and our followers can um, read a fuller report on BM.G. This report focuses mainly on emer emerging uh, markets, not the developing world. What is the reason for that? Why that focus on emerging markets? Well, the, the, the report that you're talking about is our global economic outlook, and it's it's really focused on the the global macro cycle. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we focused on 20 countries in this report. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they only account, uh, you're absolutely right, they're, they're, it's not comprehensive. So they only account for, I think, about 80 percent of world GDP. But they do account for the majority of the cycle in world GDP. Historically, if you see these 20 large countries, you know, and they 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 match the the IMF's global GDP mm -hmm. cycle very very closely. So um, so we, we we think it's it's good enough to tell you what's happening in terms of the global economic cycle. But obviously, there's lots of countries that are not here. The frontier isn't here. Uh, you say develop, developed countries, you know, and and those countries, in a, in a way, the uh, I, I think. What matters more for those, what matters a lot for those countries is sort of global financial conditions. Um, and and if, if global financial conditions change, if, say, the dollar starts to appreciate, we get a further increase in US long term interest rates, you know, that, that could be quite important for those countries. So those changes in global financial conditions will be happening because the US economy is improving. But then but those changes in global financial conditions may be happening as other, other economies are still struggling. And, and yeah, that, that's where the potential uh, challenges could, could come in for some of these developed countries. You know, we've recently written a port, report about the, the taper tantrum, the second taper tantrum. You know, and we have highlighted that some of these smaller countries with a, a lot of uh, a lot of dollar debt could, you know, could, could see some pressures. What can be done to close that inequality gap between um, developing world and the, and the developed uh, world? I mean, you know, you know, there's a huge sort of global cooperation uh, initiative on, on, the, on the vaccine with COVAX. You know, that, that's obviously going to be a very important part of this, you know, and, and somebody has said, you know, um, until the, the crisis isn't solved anywhere, until it's solved everywhere. So you know, there's there's clearly strong incentives for uh, for that sort of vaccine sharing initiative to, to, be, to be scaled 
scaled up. Um, to some extent, you know, if, if we do, if we do move beyond the health crisis, the sort of previous dynamics should reassert themselves. You know, emerging markets should be able to then, you know, grow grow at a stronger rate than than, than develop developed countries but I, th I think um you know the pickup in world trade is helping as well so there, there'll be lots of you know spillovers from stronger growth in the us as we just as we discussed and in europe you know there's going to be a, a lot of fiscal support even even into 2022 because of the the, the next generation eu recovery fund you know, that's going to be important for lots of uh, lots of european countries uh, as, as 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 well but I think I think we are probably going to be, you know, for, for, certainly for this year, there's going to be a bit of a delay in this catch up process. But, you know, you would have thought over the next three or four years that 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 that, that process should should reassert it, should reassert itself. Uh, but how sustainable is to keep job places and to keep unemployment uh, with uh, with stimulus and with, with these employment packages and how long can it be sustained? Well, it, you know, it has been effective so far. So if we look at Europe, unemployment hasn't risen anywhere near as much as we expected at the beginning of the crisis. So there's been a strong, there's a strong impact there, no, no doubt about it. But you're absolutely right. It, it can't. It can't go on forever. That's not that you know you can't, you can't just run economies by throwing money at them. Um, but this is where I think solving the health crisis is absolutely crucial. I mean, in, in many ways, you can sort of see this policy support, this very exceptional policy support, is sort of providing a bridge for the private sector to the other side of the health crisis. The health crisis does need to be solved. You do need to allow uh, service industries to come back. Social distancing needs to be uh, needs to be un unwound um, in order for this to be a sustained recovery. I, I don't think you can, at the end of the day, you cannot make economies grow for three, four, five, six years just by throwing money at them. It, it, you know, this this is this is not the answer in the long term. The health crisis has got has got to be solved. But you know, if you look at if you look at China's recovery, you know that 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 tells that tells that story very very clearly. You know, China was the first to really kind of get a grip on the on the pandemic um, and was the first major economy uh, to to come back and 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 reach pre virus levels. The U.S. stimulus that revised all these growth forecasts uh, upward. It is a massive uh, stimulus. How easy will it be to to withdraw it from from the market? Because you know that's that's not only economic issue. It becomes political issue as well sometimes. Yeah, this is going to be a really, a really big challenge um, and deciding, you know, qu how quickly, you know, when to start and how quickly to start uh, is going to be uh, a, a really big uh, a head a headache for policymakers over the next couple of years. Absolutely. I think in, in, in many ways, the first the first area where we're going to see this is with central banks. Um, and with the asset purchase programs, the QE, you know, the, the Fed is currently buying $120 billion a month. The, the ECB has got this huge pandemic emergency uh, uh, pr program. You know, they're, they're still putting more and more stimulus into the economy every, every month. I think the first thing that's going to change is that we're going to see that wound down. We're going to see the Fed probably um, September, October time start to talk about tapering their asset purchases, reducing the pace of pace of purchases per month. I don't think they'll do that until next year, but they will definitely they will definitely taper in the first half of next year. We think that they'll stop asset purchases at the end of next year. And um, we don't really know how that's going to affect financial markets. I mean, you know, a lot of this money has been going into the equity market, been going into risk asset, risk assets, boosted risk appetite. Um, so how that changes once the central banks start to uh, at least scale back the accommodation um, is, is, a, is a really big question hanging over the markets, I think. Um, and, and nobody really knows how much difference uh, this, this, this has made. So it's going to be a very interesting time in the financial markets um, as, as recoveries mature and policymakers start to take away some of this exceptional support. Just to sum up, what would be the recommendations from, from Fitch at, at this point? What should be done in order to sustain this uh, upward trend of, uh, of economic growth? Um, and when, you know, we're not in the business of, of providing policy advice. What all I can say is, you know, what, what I think governments are going to be doing, you know, is very much, uh, you know, focusing on uh, continuing to provide macro policy support through the rest of this year as the health crisis evolves. 
um, while at the same time, you know, trying to um, step up the vaccine rollout. Um, um, but and, and you know, until we've until we've reached this point where the health crisis itself starts to ease more significantly, uh, I think that policy support is 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 going to remain is going to remain very much in very much in place. So I, I think it's still. Um, still that that sort of twin approach, you know, support provide lots of support for the economy um, while trying to solve the health crisis through these through uh, through through vaccination. I think those are the two key themes that we see for. Um, so we can say that the uncertainty uh, uh, is still quite high for the for the world, even in twenty twenty one. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the, um, the, the way the virus is potentially mutating, you know, we could have problems with the vaccine rollout. Um, you know, people may not want to take the vaccine or the, or the vaccine may become less effective because there's a new, there's a new uh, a variant or a mutation of the virus in a certain way. Um, you know, there's going to be restrictions on international travel because of that, because countries that, you know, see some success domestically in containing the health crisis, they don't want, they don't, you know, what they're worried about then is that people start to travel internationally and bring new variants of the virus back into the country. So, um, you know, which could undermine all the good work. So lots and lots of uncertainties about, about exactly when the health crisis eases um, and lots of policy restrictions that will go, which will continue while that uncertainty is still there. So uh, definitely the uncertainty has, has not gone away. Hey guys, stay tuned, subscribe and follow us on BMG.